people institutes like yours or institutes like us or people in business make decisions. Why do we make decisions? And I came up with this thing that our decisions are based on where we grew up and our values and what we were taught. So all the decisions that you make in, the, in, in, in your institute or the students make or our students make are not what we teach them. It is coming out of that possibly, but it's also coming from how they were raised. Then comes this second part, and I've broken it down to major, major sections, is educational. So I go back, I spend time with my family, I grow up, I go to an institution, I study, I set it down the line, and I start making decisions based on what I've learned at the university. And then finally, the work experience. Now, what if the people that taught me came from the same society? What if the people that I work for come from the same society? And if I am going to come from the same society, is it possible that I am taught that, that is part of the subtle is part of my education through my education and that's a subtle part of what I do when I work. So I ask this question again I'll ask this question here. Nina and I had an arranged marriage some like two years ago. No, I would say 32 years ago. How many in here would say that it is irrelevant that arranged marriages are still valued and relevant. How many of you would say that? None. We come to India is it most of us would be okay with this. The most of you would, more would be okay, right? Okay. So if I ask the students and I looked at the numbers of the students, they looked at the numbers over the years. Arranged marriages in India, in terms of what is happening, has a deep drop. Okay. So the students' responses would be, maybe, okay, the majority of them would say, maybe it's not okay. If I ask the faculty, they would say, pretty high. And if I ask the same thing about the U.S. citizen, the U.S. students and the U.S. faculty, and I did this before I came, all right? Look at this. Zero percent thought that it was okay that it is not a relevant option in terms of getting married. Now explain to me how did you decide that it is relevant and the same person in the United States thinks that it's relevant. It's opposite. How can that be? It is based on what? Culture. The culture and the experience that you grew up with. Right? So if you make a major decision such as a marriage, and you said, that is the decision I made. How many decisions in business do you make that are related to your culture? So, what I came up with is that, and this is the first thing I want to ask you. There are two paradigms I want you to think about. What we have is productivity, and we have employee well-being. Fair enough? Do you believe that I can increase my productivity because I make my people work harder. How many people in here would say institutionally or from a value system, that is what I inherently believe? Majority of you say that the harder that I make some people work, the more productive we're going to become. All right? The second paradigm, which is, well, if I can reduce the amount of work, will my productivity go up? And the answer is majority of the people in here or would not say, or in the United States, would say that's not true. Now think about this. I have been taught by my culture to push people because I believe by pushing people and getting them to do something, I am going to become more productive. Yeah. So when I look at this, one person working, a lot of people not working, sitting here, what would you do? I have never lived in India, but I grew up in, from an Indian family in Iran, and at the age of 18, I went to the United States. So every so often, I come back. I look at India, I look at Iran, I look at the United States, it doesn't make a difference. If I have paid somebody to do a job, and they are sitting, not doing anything, because they have completed their task, 
I will find things for them, whether it is relevant or not. Because the thought process, my culture tells me what? That if I have paid somebody, make them work. But if you make them work, would they become more productive tomorrow? Or if you let them relax, would they be more productive tomorrow? So I wanted to show you something that I came up with. And this is about now, so we set the stage that you make decisions based on your culture. Now, in business school or in engineering school, when you say, let's design a system, let's design an operation, let's get net profitability, let's raise the stock price, let's do all of this, what is it that you're trying to do? Okay, look at this. I sat down one day and I said, the, well, the ideal system that we're trying to shoot for is where the supplier of a system has zero variation and zero, zero disruption. Perfect, we have perfection coming in. My production is balanced, is a single piece flow, and has no disruption. All right, and no variation. Perfection. And then I have a customer demand, which the customer is no demand, is zero variation, and it's zero disruption, it's perfection. What we are showing in our engineering schools and business schools is models towards perfection. Perfection is what we're trying to do. Now, here's, I was at Boeing many years ago. This is the 737 plan, the Boeing 737 plan, before they make the changes. Okay. If you notice, this is the fuselage. The fuselage comes, it comes here, you take it out, you take it into each of these stations, you take it into each of the stations, and the plane is finished. And the plane is completed in what? In, let's say, three days or four days, the plane is complete. That's not good enough. Now, people that work, that cannot get plants moved from one place to another in three days, we're putting an airplane together in three days. And so we designed this system, watch this. This system is after it's designed. This is a moving line. The planes are now moving at a steady rate, steady rate, steady rate, steady rate. Notice the planes are on two sides. There's no planes on this side. This is all logistics. All things coming into the planes. The planes are moving, and as the planes move, the people are addressing to that rate of what? That rate of perfection. This is perfection. It doesn't stop. And here's what happened. Every seat number is lined up. See if seat comes in one, two, three, four, five, six, it's lined up like this. All of these are engineering and business people. If the line stops, they, everybody rushes down. Perfection is what we see. Now, if perfection is what we see, what is it that people want? This is from my model I was telling you about. One day I was sitting around and I said, what, what would Maslow? Here's what people would want. You start with people that are young or people that are there and they work for a living. I want a paycheck. I have a basic living. The second way is I want to be safe. I want to work, I want to be safe. Emotionally, behaviorally, physically, I want to be safe. Third, oh, everything is good. I don't want to spend 18 hours at work. I want to balance some life. Fourth, I want to be engaged. Why am I doing this? What is the meaning of life? And fifth is I've done all of this. I want you to recognize me. If I do all of these things, Watch this. I'm doing this. Look at this. We think that this is what? This is, remember, what is it? What was the movie? Where these were slaves that were moved, rowing ships. We watch these in late movies. Watch this system. This system is what? I produce to a rate. I'm a slave. I cannot leave that. Right? I do what you want to do and it's very routine. The task is routine. Look, if I have a perfect system, what do I create? I run to a system. It is routine and I cannot leave that system. This is uncivilized. And this is civilized. This is civilized, but it is the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. So, 
Is it possible that there is a fundamental conflict between human resources and production? There is. And is it a very important concept in countries like the United States or countries like India? I looked at India before I came because I was coming out here. And I always thought that the balance of life in India is actually very good. It is actually very bad. I looked at a couple of things that I cannot remember. All CEOs that have come to India and work, they said, what are your impressions? One of the impressions was balance of life. If I looked at millennials and their life, it's actually one of the worst in the world in terms of balance of life. So let me answer this question. You are creating perfect systems in business school. You're creating perfect systems in engineering schools. Have you ever thought that you are part of the problem that creates opioid dependence. No, I'm not, it's not a direct link. But is it possible that that's what it is? So, I want to show you something, and this is some things I picked up. If I look at productivity on the, and I don't think you can see this, productivity on the x-axis, and I can look at the average work, uh, done per hour, uh, average number of hours worked per week. And I took the top 35 countries in terms of productivity. Okay? The, greens, the green ones are the top most productive countries. If you look at the second, uh, the sec is, it should not be mediocre. The second, the middle group should be uh, the yellow and the least productive out of the 35 are the red. This is average work, this is productivity. Watch this. As I look, what does it show us? That the most productive societies are what? The ones that are working the less. Why? Because there is a fundamental difference. And I can tell you, as I was reading through this, there's one country where if you take all of your six weeks of vacation, they actually give you a bonus. If I, in another country, if I ever asked you, that it is overtime, you must come in overtime. It is fundamentally a unthought concept. But in India, what is it? Yeah, I you know, you know, in the US, you better be here. We have to get productivity up. So why is it that the most productive countries are the ones that are working the less? And the most the least productive countries, Mexico, for example, is the country that produces works the maximum number of hours. And where do you think it ranks in productivity? It's not even in the top 10, 35. Here are the top 10 countries. Uh, this is, I believe, in 2017. Uh, Luxembourg, Norway, Switzerland, Denmark, Iceland. Iceland is a new one, smaller country, so it's, it's cropped up there. US, Australia, Ireland, and there's a Sweden. These are the number of average annual hours worked per worker. Okay, and this is primarily when I developed this, it is for the US. Look at the US. Where is the US? Iceland has a small population, so I can say, well, it's, it may not be exactly there, but if you look at the US, 1783 hours. If I look at this, work related, again, I'm sorry, it may not look right. This is work balance, okay, ranking out of 150 countries. Look at the top 10 countries. Okay, look at the US. Right. Look at the percentage of paid population threshold that work over 49 hours. Look at the US. All right. If I look at country-related stress, Bloomberg's most stressed countries, or the healthiest countries in the world, you'll see the same ranking in the sense that the countries that are putting a lot of people at work, <coughs> large hours of work, are not healthy, lifestyles are not good. So what does that show you about what we were taught as we were growing up? Now I'm not going to ask you this. When you are in IIM, or Abe is at the University of Tennessee, 
Is your thinking correct? In, is there any class that you teach in which you say that I must look at this particular help of our society? So what we've done in this particular case now is we've developed a model called Sustainable Operation Excellence Model. And I will show you what this model is. This is my aunt sent me from India. And so I thought it would be good. If hard work pays, show me a rich dog. I thought that's really funny. Okay, then I thought about it. But it's okay. But watch this. That donkey, the, what they put in the back of the truck, and what Edward Deming said, is exactly the same. Look at the rest. To help people do a better job with less effort. Edward Deming says that. I ask you this question, how many of us, including me, in this room, sit here and follow that truck principles for that? So we have this model of lean. And we, lean says we must reduce waste. And they have like eight categories of waste. You must not transport, you must not waste, you must not do all these things. Ours is this, development and enhancement of culture that provides the greatest quantity of achieving values of an organization. Now, I take this, and I'm going to show you the principles that we follow. Abe is a student of mine in the master's program. If he comes to me and he designs a system, and he says, well, Dr. Sunny, I've reduced cycle time, I've reduced variation, I've reduced disruption, and he does not mention anything to me to uh, improving the quality of life. Abe, what do we do? We actually consider the, the quality of life, so we do take that into consideration. Watch this, he is the first generation of students that thinks like that. So our principles are reduce cycle time. If I can do it, and reduce cycle time. If I can reduce variation, if I can reduce disruption, and I, then I can, by that, I can improve the quality of life. Here's the model. And I can, I'm going to take you through it. But the module, the model is developed into four modules. It comes through the idea of critical problem solving. In critical problem solving, what do we do? Define a problem, solve a problem, and sustain the solution. That must have that. How many students do you think have that confidence? I can tell you this. Our students, I don't know about IIM, are excellent at solving a problem. They're terrible at defining the problem. They are terrible at sustaining a solution. They can only solve the problem. For example, if I say to you in India, what is a problem? Well, if already somebody's already defined the problem for you, it's easy. Well, which model should I use? What algorithm should I use? What should I do? And you solve the problem. But how many of your students are actually able to go into an organization of all the problems prioritize and solve the key problem. That's very important. We don't teach that. If we taught that, is it possible that we can reduce the stress on individuals? Because we define not many problems, but one problem. That is the critical problem at that point. The second component of this is we make sure that we understand what we call leading indicators. Leading indicators are your projects that you do. And then we take them and we translate them to organizational outcomes. Because I have seen, I cannot tell you the number of companies, we have probably worked with over 300 companies. I cannot tell you the number of times I've gone into a company and I've looked at it and I said, oh my God, why are they doing this? It has absolutely no impact. We were in Mexico and Nina was with me in Mexico. And we had one week to take the students and change a company. And the company said, we want you to work on these six projects. Right? This is the management of the company. All six projects were wrong. Had nothing to do with the outcome of the organization. The third model here is something called reliability of systems, lean systems. I don't want to push anybody to work harder. I simply want to do what? I want to provide you with all the resources so that you can be successful. And the final word is to sustain. And the sustain is, and I'll show you, if you can make sure the motivation is intact, 
you can make sure engagement is intact, that you can make sure cultural values are intact, you're going to be fine. So, our benefits are we reduce the resource and effort level via strategic problem solution solving. We align all efforts with system growth and competitiveness and engage management to ensure continuity of support and the resources by providing organizational outcomes. Goal three, enhance capacity via throughput based on a surgical approach to minimize time and effort of, uh, effort of implementation. Watch this. How many projects do you have the students do or you have done as consultants that should have taken, in your mind, two months, but has taken 12 months? Why? If we can take it and reduce it down, and then finally, it has an employee quality in mind. So I'm going to take you through the model now. This model is very simple. If I can show you this, I think this way. And I can then come back and show you this. Why is this organization constrained? What function in this organization is constrained? What is the key value stream within that function that is constraining? Okay. What is the critical path that is constraining that function? You see that? I take an organization, somebody tells me, I want you to come and consult with us on production. But the problem is not production. The problem is somewhere else. So here, what we do is key, key three, three key things, critical path determination, critical path categorization and critical path strategy, if I could show you that. This is a network. If I looked at that particular network and I looked at no variability in that network, it may be that the red line up there is my critical path. Fair? If I look at low variability, that, that thing may still be the critical path. If I take high variability, my critical path may change. So my first thought process is, what is the technique that you teach your students or you apply yourself to solve, to identify the problem or the critical path? And in that critical path, when you design it and solve it, do you consider variability or variation? If you don't, how would you know what the problem is? Now, watch this. Abe, I don't know what the problem is. Abe, go do all this. Go do 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 this. Watch this. I still look good. What is Abe doing? So, then, this is our terminology, so I want to explain this. I think this is Kampf Swang. How come in our classes, when we say both find and solve this operation, do we always say all processes and systems are the same? We don't have any categorization, do we? But in, in medicine, when you come in, don't, isn't the first thing we say to the patient, you have this type of category of problem or this problem. You're going to die or you're not going to die? Then, this is what's going to happen. How come in our terminology, do we not categorize for our students or for our industry the fact that there are very different type of processes? We have, what we have done is we have said we have deterministic processes. These processes are repeatable routes, minimal variation and arrival and minimum, uh, in, in, and minimum variation in process times. Production line, electronic assembly, Boeing moving line, hospital implementing, surgery, service, uh, sterilization process, simple surgeries. These are repeatable. Everybody knows what they're doing. Stochastic, repeatable, repeatable route, but there's a tremendous variation in both the arrival and the process time. Okay. Batch production, high product mix, hospital environments, patient care department, surgery scheduling, pharmacy. For example, in surgery scheduling of a hospital, which is a project that we're doing right now, how many, what do you think is the biggest problem? Variation in the fact that the surgery, first surgery does not start on time. How is it possible 
when you're starting the first surgery, now watch this, because I don't care that first surgery impacts the second surgery, the second surgery impacts the third surgery, and then what you have is what should take from eight hours can take 10 hours. One thing, and we did a study, and the model showed us that if we fix just the first surgery, there's a 70% 70 production, 70 production, uh, 70 reduction on effort. The third is Bayesian. Bayesian is, I don't know. Based on my condition, I can go this way or this way. Okay? Production environments, job shops, custom shops, hospital environments, emergency rooms. Emergency room, I go in, you're okay, here's uh, something to do, or I may go into an operation. Why is that important? Watch this. There are three things every system needs to be fixed, and they are not soup. They have to be separated. It is flow, variation, and disruption. Flow is how we manage the logistics of the operation. Variation, the inconsistency in which we do it, and disruption is the inconsistency that leads to the shutdown. If I look at a different deterministic model, deterministic model is an assembly line fixed. that's automated, right? You have an idea of the perfect system. The perfect system, right? Watch this. The first thing that most perfect systems we should look at is disruption. That's the number one issue. These are perfect systems. Run, 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 then break because of quality, because of maintenance. Okay. Second most important thing is the in inconsistency, and the third thing is flow. Inconsistency and flow is already designed into the system. How do you define flow? The logistics. The logistics is, the flow is the balance and the amount of material that I move from it. Is that, is that right? Stochastic. So, stochastic is what? Stochastic is, in, I know about the things, but they are very uncertain. The number one thing is what? Variation. Number two is disruption. Number three is flow. Bayesian. Bayesian is an emergency room. We did an emergency room. How many possible routes do you think in an emergency room there exists for a patient? 22. You're not going to fix all of, all of those. You're going to fix what? Some of those. So the first thing is to find which ones, then to come back, look at the variation, disruption, etc., and then go back and fix the flow. Now, for those people that teach operations, and you teach operations, what are you primarily focusing on? Flow, variation, or disruption? In your operations, when you write an OR model, what do you do? I move from here to here, I move from here to here. So it's flow. It's flow. In lean, it is flow. Everything is based on the primary paradigm by which we think and design is flow. But look at this. If I said the primary thing that we teach and do is flow, yet in this model, flow is the last thing we should look at. Right. So, is it possible? So what we have done is we have then developed a strategy that says if I can combine these two together and stabilize the process, I'm stabilizing my patient. And then I'm going to treat my patient. So the second module is, is an interesting module because this is my binoculars. And I connect through my binoculars this to this. This is what? This is where my people are working. This is where people work. This is how I judge whether the people are doing a good job. So I have to connect, make a connection between the work that people do and the outcome. And this is my throughput. So I have this thing, so I can come back. So three things. Look at the binoculars for a minute. The binoculars, if I could take it at the basic level, is Little's law that says throughput is a function of width, which is the amount of resources, over cycle. Cycle time is 
from the time I start to the time I finish something. From the time I start to the time I finish something. Now watch this, if I can show you this. I'm going to come on this side. This is cycle time, is the actual time that it takes something to be completed, actual time. This is lead time, which is the planned time to do this. How many of your students or us, I'm not talking about, when I'm talking about you, I'm talking all of us as a society, do we teach our students to look at the difference between actual cycle time and lead time? Isn't it possible in the majority of cases where you have a lot of stress, what is happening? The cycle time, the actual time that it takes, is longer than the lead time. How many of you as faculty work more than you should? Why? Why? Is it possible what they plan for versus how long it takes? There's a difference. Now, let's talk about how long it takes. I'm going to take it out here. How long it takes is dependent upon what? The variations. The variation. The intensity. How many of you today did not do what you were supposed to do? When you came in this morning and you said, I'm going to do this. How many of you did do that? There was inconsistency. So therefore, tonight you're going to stay late, isn't it? That is the plan, but then it might get postponed to tomorrow as well. Well, that's for tomorrow. but if you do it tomorrow, what you plan for tomorrow? Yeah. So what you're going to do is you're going to, you are being forced to work harder because of what? The variation. <laughs> now, how many of you have measured the variation of your work at IIM? Show me a single statistic at the University of Tennessee or at IIM that shows me the level of variation that exists in that process. starts. We don't know what time the meetings are. Well, the meeting is not something that should, should have variation. Your research, I agree, is a component. I can think about it, I cannot think about it. It takes me time, I cannot think. But uh, the two, two things also which happens is that that's where possibly a little bit of that maybe the, how the work is structured and as well. Maybe the cultural factors also. This is part of the culture, yes. Concurrent is that possibly it gets extended because of this because in meetings that's the time when we possibly socially interact also. True. It's not and another thing also what happens is that in organizations that's also primarily in flexibility from an HR perspective we say that look it's actually a part of the trade off. What happens is that predictability certain predictable work you trade off against flexibility. So as faculty, we have tremendous level of flexibility that I can decide maybe not to come to office for three days, okay, maybe sit and just contemplate, okay, and then maybe work for two, three days, or maybe not do any work at all, like me. No, no, that's not true. Okay. <laughs> that's also an option. That's not true. Okay. Or, or Another issue which I always say is that a lot of Indians, which I keep on telling in organizations is overwork is not because they like, they don't have anything else to do. Say that again? They don't have anything else to do because this is a concept called work centrality. My entire identity is around my 
work. So I don't have anything else to do. I don't have hobbies. I don't. In fact, our previous <coughs> dean, who was a behavioral scientist, when she met the faculty and she was talking, she was very surprised that none of you guys have got any hobbies. And I think you're not unique because I don't think that any of us <laughs> have any hobbies. Yeah. So, so many times you work because... Yeah. No, the reason I gave you the example of faculty, even though there is a flexibility on this, is here's the thing. If faculty have that level of flexibility and the, the nature of work requires variability, yeah. Can you imagine where you design systems where there is actually no variability in it that you've designed, but there is variability? We had good old times to Diane like that. Yeah. Many years before our system was designed like that. I of course when I joined, I heard some of the faculty and faculty would tell me that you finish the course, you finish your responsibilities, take off, take a break. Just inform by telling one week, I won't be there, I'll take a break. That's it. You manage it. But be responsible that your absence will not uh, impact the Everybody, anybody else. The program. Yeah. That's your responsibility. Yeah. We had a good time like that. Yeah. Now, but watch this. This is a simulation model I did. Okay? So this is a simulation model. It can be any process. So it has nothing to do with this idea. So in this particular case, I have five stations, and you can say, here's the five stations. It can be office stations, it can be anything. Uh, what I wanted to show you was the following. I have coefficient, coefficient of variability, 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. 50%. According, according to the guidelines, low variability in a process is 75%. So everything I have here is low variability. This is all low variability. This is like really good systems. So if, in this case, if I have numbers such as, where did it go? Uh, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. The total time that it should take me is the actual process time is 50 minutes. If I have 5%, which is almost like perfect, watch what happens to this number. From 50, it goes to what? 94. 10 to 136. 20 to 200 all the way to 50, which is still low variability, to 423. Watch this, my cycle time, that actual cycle time, went from 50 to over 400. Based on what? Variability. But again, not in your faculty or our faculty, take any manufacturer, take any hospital, take any government office, they in the process. There is this. no measurement of the level of variation that exists in the process. Yet, then, this variability is killing me. This is the heart attack that I'm having, but there is nothing called a heart attack. I'm simply going to die. And what I'm going to do as a result is I'm going to push people to do more. Watch this. It is not so easy. This is what we call a push system. This is called a pull system. The impact of variability in a pull system is much less. Right? A convex system is exactly the same. So it depends on the system and its variability. So this is something that we have to understand. Module three is this, this idea that we develop called relinability. This is something that they are trying to figure out whether we should trade market or not. It's simply the concept of lean and reliability combined, and we call it, it's called effectiveness, and it's a function of reliability and efficiency. Now, again, I'm going to use this concept of reliability. Okay. So what is reliability? <coughs> Enhancing the throughput of a system by providing reliability of material, people, equipment, information in a manner that enhances the quality of life. Watch this. We have now, I've categorized reliability in four categories. In every process, what is the reliability of material? What is the reliability of people? And what is the reliability of equipment? And what is the reliability of information? Now, 
If you look at office, what is the most important? Information of people. If you look at manufacturing, it changes to possibly material and equipment. So not necessarily are all four equally important. You have to have components of it. This concept of reliability is very important. When you go into companies, it is one thing to teach, it is another to implement. When you go, the biggest thing is not the mathematical equations or the concepts that you have taught. It is the fact that somebody that is sitting in a nursing or sitting in a manufacturing or a government office with 40 years of experience, you have a kid that goes and says, well, I've learned about this. Let me show you how to implement this. They will be nice to you, but as soon as you turn around, the problem that our students have is the fact that they cannot convince people to change. Sorry. Because they use the word efficiency. When I say efficiency to you, what does it mean? What does efficiency mean to you? Efficiency means what? I'm actually calling you bad words. Efficiency means what? You're not efficient. Okay. Right? What is not efficient? It's a very negative tone. Okay, when I say your efficiency, what, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? I must work harder. Is it not? How is lean that talks about efficiency, that all of these agility, flexibility, model, all of these things that talk about efficiency, the first thing out of your mouth that you tell somebody that goes across to another person is, 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 is used a cuss word. He's called me a bad word. We have changed that language to say, I don't want you to work more efficiently. We will provide you with a reliable process so you can work with it. A very different tone. So, we have decomposed the reliability of the process into these. Materials, right time, right quality, right quantity, etc. So these are failure modes that we're defining. And these are not limited. You can enhance upon the failure modes. Right? So we have material reliability, schedule reliability, personnel reliability, equipment reliability. And again, tell, tell me which one do we have the hardest time with? Personal reliability. Right. I want to show you how this works. Again, we're trying to show this very simply to you. This is my trim, spinning drill, shear. Underneath the trim, what I do is I have my materials, underneath my materials, I have my failure modes, and I can decompose these. What I then do is I collect all this information, okay? And what I do is now, for the first time, in a process, rather than efficiency, I can decompose the whole system in terms of reliability and prioritize that. Because I can now look at each of these reliabilities and say what impact it has on my tool. For example, like that. This is a much more humane way of doing it. It is a way to provide and reduce stress on individuals because I am giving you what you want. It is the onus is on me, not on you, to do this. Now we're going to talk about if I have. I think I have maybe five or ten minutes. This is where we are weak on. This is, I think, we were talking where we need your help. Let me tell you what we do. And you tell me if it is correct or not. First thing, when we design the system, I use the concept of system thinking. System thinking is what? Watch this. Nina and I are married. She has a box on top of her head. I have a box on top of mine. If these two boxes when we meet, are exactly the same, right? There is a reason. This, 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 this seminar, if the concept is we won't want to share information, this is a good concept, seminar. If the concept is, uh, for me, I want to get out of here, and you say, no, I want to learn, there is now a conflict. Systems thinking allows me to do this and model this. So I can actually model where we have crossed someone's motivation. What motivation? Well, again, and this is again very simplistic. 
I ask my question, if it is a production line, why is this person working? Is this person working for money? Is this person working for uh, safety? Is they working for balance of life? Are they working for this? What had I designed that has now done what? Demotivated for art. So we can use this, and there are things like any logic that can actually model this. The second thing that we do, that we have looked at, and we tested this out, in my opinion, once I say that I have not motivated, demotivated this person, he is still able to earn a living. He is still able to do these things. And again, there is not a single thing. Your demographics that you design for has different people in each one. In manufacturing, where do you think most, of, most people are? Level one or level two? Safety or money? If you go to top executives, where do you think they are? <laughs> but I think they are in, in that thing of, I want to be recognized. So you have, do not have an individual motivation. You have to look at it individual by individual by individual to look at this. The second thing that we do is we look at engagement. And engagement to us is a very, very different thing. Uh, growth is an important thing. In that place that where this person is, can they grow? Do they think they're going to be valued? All right? And then can, do they have autonomy to make decisions? What do you like best about your job as faculty? Autonomy. Nobody tells you what to write. Absolutely. Absolutely. But here's the thing. Majority of the people outside of this environment have zero autonomy to make decisions. This is my personal observation, right or wrong. In India, what I have observed over this period of time that I've come and gone, so it's a very sh small sample, and it could be wrong. There is no autonomy to make decisions. If I have to ask somebody, they send me to somebody. They send me to another person. They send me to another person. They send me to... I have to go to five people to get a decision made. Nina and I go to the bank in India. And I have... I signed my check. They said, my sign... Your sign doesn't match. I said, okay. But you know it's me. You don't know it's me. Yes, it's you. Your sign doesn't match. Well, I signed it five times. It still doesn't match. So she brings me. It doesn't work that way. Huh? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't? It doesn't work that way. Ask me. It is. If yes. I, no, if, if, if your sign doesn't match, you don't get money. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that is it. Yeah, that so is you know what, what, she, what she eventually did? She brought me my own signature. But you have to So I can <laughs> do this now. Yeah. And then she had to go to the manager to ask. See, this autonomy does not exist. And this autonomy is critical to human living. This is critical to human being. Growth is critical to human being. Autonomy is critical to human being. And being, being what? Valued. Uh, the differences I see, I want to just share with you. Again, right or wrong is not a question. I would not let my maid, a maid that is in Nina's house or my house, pick up my dishes. If I'm eating it, I'm going to put my own dishes away. If I'm leaving and I'm hugging her sister, I'm going to hug, hug the maid as well. So I sat, we sat in the living room. Where did the maid sit? No? In the kitchen, hidden from us. Why? These are small issues that one has to be cognizant. I'm not saying, these are cultural, so it's not a matter of we can quickly change it. But these are issues that you have to look at. We value people equal to us or above us. Our values, people that we perceive to be below us, are not exactly the same. And then finally, we do the last thing that we do is on Hofstede method, method, and I think that you would know about this. And what we do is we look at individualism, power distance, mass masculinity. Individualism is, is what? Whether you're a team player or not. Okay? 
so we do this kind of work. We look at this. For example, Americans are not team players. Right? It's all individualistic. So if you say a concept of design that is based on teams in the US, it will fail. What about India? Team players or individuals? Depends. 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 Power distance. Power distance is your relationship to your boss. Okay? In, in the United States, for example, I can say to you, if I'm the boss, uh, somebody can come to me and say, I disagree. So we sit down and hash it out. In China, for example, <coughs> you better not disagree. Keep quiet. What about India? Power distance is very high. It's also high. Also high? Yes. Let's look at uncertainty avoidance. I'm skipping one so that we can finish. Uncertainty avoidance, that means your acceptance of uncertainty. Watch this, this is very critical. The reason I'm only going to that now is it is related to our discussions above. The United States, if I am to be here, if they said to us, we spend a week in an ashram, Nina forced me to go detox in an ashram in Bangalore. It was very, very hot. Right. But if they said 6.30, I was there at 6.30. And at 6.30, when I went there, nobody was there, the door was closed. I opened the door of that particular panchkar. If they told us your treatment is going to be at 7 o'clock, we were there at 5 minutes to 7, and what time did they take us? 7.30. 7 now, not, not good or bad, let's not talk about this. In, in the United States, the tolerance for uncertainty is very low. Now watch this. Remember the first thing I said is inherently cultural. Second thing is acceptance of what? Variability. What level of variation do you accept in a system? If your culture values are accepting variability in a system, that variability is causing your cycle times to go out of control. Therefore, you have to work hard is one of the key things. And finally, these are the same things that we're looking at. I'm going to show you one last thing. And this was a study I'm going to leave, which is based on a PhD student of mine that just finished, on how we can connect actual work to these, these parameters. I'm going to show you that everything that I talked about here, <coughs> we are testing at this moment in about like five or six, six different places. So we have either entire lines or entire manufacturing processes that have been given to us for one year. I'm going to show you one year in this, this case. And Abhishek, uh, Abe is here. This is a very different environment than what you see. This is the largest producer of manufactured homes in the world. Okay? They produce homes uh, on the manufacturing line. Here's what I saw. This can be, I mean, what, as much as 48 to 78 feet? Yeah, that would be 2,400 square feet of the house. So the length of this could vary. And therefore, the settings and where the plumbing and the electrical goes and the wire, the walls go changes. Here's what I saw. If this indicates it, there are teams of five, four or five, six people that go, and this is what I saw, if I can just show you. Person one is going like this. Person two is going like this. There is absolutely no connection. During the required period of consideration, the required period of consideration is for a job to be done. You know what they were held accountable for? Not that period of time. After one day, what have you done? So, when you look at this, what is the issue that comes? The biggest problem they have is variation. If I could reduce that variation, watch what happens. This is currently a paper that Abe and uh, who? Nenad. Huh? Nenad and Roshanak. Nenad and Roshanak are putting together. Very nice paper that they're going to put together. 
what we did is created something called zone-based manufacturing or zone-based work design. And what it does is it takes, you were asking what it does, simplistically based on precedence and time and availability of people and their work relations, we designed the work around this. Now, this took us 500 hours of videotaping and all this kind of stuff, so it was all manual. So they're developing an algorithm for it. And so that what we can do is the following. If you take a look at this, the total time that it takes is 60 minutes for that job to be done. 24 minutes of this is where people are doing what? What do you think these people are doing? <clears throat> looking for tools, looking for material, waiting on somebody. Okay, all of these things. Fair enough. This is not rocket science. This is where we have the rough stone that will be turned into a diamond. Watch this. If I can provide you through reliability the stuff that you needed, would that number go down? Yes. Would you have to put more effort in for that individual to do that? No. So, what we did is the following. Is the orange lines are the current cycle times. The blue lines are, are the proposed. So if you notice, based on the zone-based manufacturing, we did not make anybody do anything more. And the, the green ones are piloted, but we have more pilots right now. Okay. And on the third week of January, we, they're going to give us the whole plan for two days. They're going to shut everything down and they're going to let us run it the way we want to run it. And our anticipation is that we are going to double the production. They produce seven and a half houses. Seven and a half homes per day. Okay. Theoretically, we believe that we can double it. Actually, because there's going to be a lot of issues, as you know, practically, we believe that we can go from seven and a half to nine, 10, 11, 12, you know, homes. This has an impact. If we take that thing to the 40 facilities that they have, the impact is over a billion dollars of additional capacity. A billion dollars of additional capacity. Watch this. So that's not a big deal. <clears throat> this is a, just an example. We have Fitbits that measure activity on every individual, before and after. And Abe is there because Abe is the person that is there almost every week working with them. Abe has told me, and correct me if I'm wrong, there is no individual that is working more than they did before. In fact, in the majority of cases, we reduce it by how much? We're probably half of it. Watch this. Percent. This person is 2870 steps per, per what? Per platform. Per, per floor. Per floor. Mul multiply that by seven and a half. So that would be seven and a half is somewhere over 15,000. 15,000 is how much walking does this person do? Approximately 8 to 10 miles a day. If you walk 8 to 10 miles a day, how many of you would be able to come to work? This is the environment. That person's work now is proposed down to 1310. The next one was 2455 to 1327, so far down line. There is not a single, a single individual in there that is working more. In fact, what we are going to prove on the third week of January, that I can reduce generally around 20, 25, 30% of the level of effort of each individual, and I can increase the production by whatever the amount turns out. What for the first time we have, my student has, my other students have, have broken the paradigm by which we think. And here's what has happened. We have zero resistance, zero, from everybody on the floor. We have zero resistance from the plant management. We have zero resistance from the leadership. In fact, on January 14th, I go back on January 18th, January 14th, I'm going to four different plants, or five different plants. And what they want me to do is to identify if the same thing can be carried out in those particular five plants. We hope to prove 
that human well-being and production and system design don't have to be an opposite part, that they can be done together. And the key in this is very simple. We simply make people do things, what well, majority of a lot of stuff, because we primarily ourselves don't understand what to do. And therefore, go to this, 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 go to this. You know, of all of these 10 things that you're going to do, it's going to be fine. The second thing is, if you do not look at the variability of that particular system and include that into every design system, you are not going to be able to stabilize the process to fix it in any way. And in the process, not only are you going to not sustain your solutions, you're going to kill the people along the way. If we were in the medical field, we would be sued for what we do to society. Because we are not held accountable, we design and we walk away. And there is no accountability that is attached to us that says, oh my God. But if you look at me, and I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. I do not know how many people I have negatively impacted in my life. But I think that that is done. We're no longer going to do that. So the courses that we teach, the material that we do, the research that we do, is primarily now all based on this idea of aligning these two things together. And I think, is that okay? I think that was the last slide. So if, if you need to contact me, just call me on this number. Uh, we have, within our group, we have grown this group from zero to about 40 or so people. We now have staff. We now have students, which are primarily PhD and master's students. And this is all we do. Uh, the proposed things that we still have on the table is we're doing piloting this. We have a contract that because of elections in Mexico, we don't, we're not sure if it's going to go. But we have the idea that this thing is we were going to implement this in all public hospitals in Mexico. Uh, we're using this to mentor uh, students and faculty at Tecno Monterrey. So this is going on, uh, and, I'm, and we're still struggling with it to say that we know everything. That's not true. We're still struggling with it, but it seems to be a model that seems to have good acceptability to it in the area of productivity. And I, for the first time, I'm going to go to a human resources conference. Which one? Uh -huh. There's one in the state of Tennessee, and then there's a national conference in Las Vegas. Oh, okay. So we're just not sure which one, but this is my first uh, entrance into the human resources side. So thank you. She's Professor Pramila. She's also a psychologist in the HR. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're two psychologists. We need a lot of help. <laughs> because I, I, as we were talking, the, our weakness is the human side. Engineers don't need, when I look at any other curriculum, I don't think that we ever look at any human thinking or behavior or anything like that. So this is new to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the job. 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 Thanks for